Now, I wanted to show you something. You know, like, this morning, Deacon Harold was talking about the anchor, and, and I don't know if you know this, I have an anchor that I wear on my wrist that I had custom made. And, and inscribed in a, on the part that goes up, coming down, it says Magnificat, and across the bottom, it says Fiat. Because I believe in my life, there is not a greater witness or example for us to follow than the Blessed Mother in terms of how we receive the Holy Spirit. She received it without question, without reservation, without hesitation. When the angel of the Lord said, the Holy Spirit's going to overpower you, he's going to overshadow you, he's going to come upon you, and you'll be the mother, mother of God, her only response is, let it be done unto me according to thy word. And those words are not resignation. Those words mean, let it happen. I'm ready for this. I think so many times we read it with the wrong context. Like she's like, okay, well, if this is got the way it's got to be, okay. Who am I to argue with God? No, she's like, let it happen to me. I want this to happen to me. This is why when she says her Magnificat, my soul rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has looked upon my lowliness and done great things for me. And that's why people will call me blessed. In the same way, people will call us blessed if we let the Lord do great things for us. Amen? Amen. All righty then. Anyone from Chicago area? I have... Great. I have a cousin that lives in Chicago. I'm very close to her. She's like um, a, a real sister in Christ as well as a cousin. And, and we, we, our, our relationship has really been deepened over uh, the last several years. <coughs> and I've, I've been to Chicago a few times. Um, in 1871, some, some, you, you probably know most of the story, the, uh, the Great Chicago Fire destroyed most of the city. And the reason it was so devastating is because on, on the sides of the river in Chicago were all these slaughterhouses. And before there were any kind of standards or environmental regulations, they would just dump everything, all the waste from these slaughterhouses into the river. <clears throat> in fact, if you look in the archives, you can see pictures of ducks standing on top of the river. They called it the Stinky River because it wasn't really a river. You know, you ever, you ever like uh, make soup and after it cools off, you get that layer of fat on top when you got the, you know, <laughs> that's what it was like. It had this layer of hardened, sticky, stinky waste on it constantly. And when the fire broke out on the side that was closest to the, the Lake Michigan, the, 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 the river itself caught on fire. That's how it spread from one side of the river to the other. The river was on fire. And that's why it was so devastating. And, and, and it was full of disease. In, in, between the 18, in the 1880s, at least 10,000 people in the city of Chicago died from cholera and typhoid fever. In 1885, 14 years after the Great Chicago Fire, nearly 100,000 people had died from illnesses carried by this diseased river. And they were actually talking about what would it take to just shut the city down and move somewhere else. It was that bad. But then the Army Corps of Engineers got together and thought, well, we, let's try something. Because as you know, the, the Chicago River flows down from the north, and it used to like curve and then go through the rest of the city. And, and what they did, though, is they built a series of locks and, and canals and caused water from Lake Michigan to flow into the river. And then they built a canal 27 miles long that connected the Chicago River, I think, to the Des Plaines River, and that flows down into the Mississippi. And what it was able to do is all this fresh water, instead of, instead of all the diseased water going out into Lake Michigan and polluting the, 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 the city's drinking water, water was coming in, fresh water was coming in and just washing all this filth away. And after, you know, it, it, they moved more earth building that canal than they did building the, the Panama Canal. It was one of the greatest feats of engineering up to that point, and it saved the, the city of Chicago. And that's amazing. And when I, when I first read this story, I thought of the uh, passage from Ezekiel in chapter 47 where God is with Ezekiel, and he says to him, Son of man, have you seen this? And he says, he's looking at this water flowing out of the temple. Because out of this temple is this flow of water. And this is what God said to Ezekiel. He said, this water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into Arabah. And when it enters the stagnant waters of the sea, the water will become fresh. 
And wherever this river goes, every, little, every living creature which swarms will live, and there will be very many fish, for this water goes there, that the waters of the sea may become fresh. That is what baptism is. God looks at our souls, and it could look like the Chicago River, full of disease and, and, and muck and grime. And he says, like, I want to wash you clean. I want, a, I want a fresh flow of the Holy Spirit to come into your life, because wherever the Holy Spirit touches things, it's made alive. Life thrives when the Holy Spirit's flowing in our lives, the life of God. So we have this term, baptism in the Holy Spirit, and I want to experience, I want to kind of explain what that means because oftentimes people can get very confused as to what we mean when we say baptism in the Holy Spirit. So I want to be really clear that first and foremost, that baptism in the Holy Spirit is an experience that, that has been given to the church to release and strengthen the effects of baptism and confirmation. It is baptism that makes us a child of God. But how many of us have lived so many years of our lives totally unaware that we're children of God? Do you wake up in the morning and go, oh my gosh, I'm a child of God. I'm a beloved princess. I'm a prince. My, God, my, my daddy's king of the universe. And because of that, I have joy in my heart. I, 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 I see so many Catholics who have no idea who they are in Christ. No idea that they've been adopted by the king of the universe and as such are heirs to his kingdom. They live like spiritual orphans, not knowing who they are. This is the great sickness that has plagued our world. People trying to find their identity in things that are passing. People are trying everything to find happiness and fulfillment. And they're buying into every lie that the world can conceive. Saying, if I just do this or this or this, the next thing, I'll find happiness. And they never do. And so the world for many people is just a hamster wheel. And they're running as fast as they can. And the world keeps holding up this and saying, come on, you can catch this. You'll be happy. So they run faster, but they're not moving anywhere. They're not getting anywhere. They're burning themselves out. They're, they're overworked. They're stressed out. And maybe even in your own life, you're feeling this way. Like, I'm just trying to find something and I'm, and I'm working so hard at it. And I've never really been happy in my life. But this grace of baptism in the Holy Spirit can get us off this hamster wheel, off this fruitless pursuit of pleasure as a way of fulfilling us and into the arms of God where we know his love and his relationship to us as father and we know ourselves new as child of God. And the term baptism in the Holy Spirit, it's a biblical term, it's in the Bible. And this experience has been affirmed by our popes throughout the history of the church, but let's start with what it says in the Bible. So Jesus in speaking in Luke chapter 12, verse 49, he says, I came to cast fire on the earth, and I wish it was already kindled. Like he, he came to set things on fire. And the most vivid image of that is the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes down and rests on them like tongues of fire. That's the fulfillment of Jesus' desire. It is God's desire that each one of us get baptized with this baptism in the Holy Spirit. He says to the, his apostles in Acts chapter 1, he says, the promise of the Father about which you heard me speak is coming. Do not depart Jerusalem, but wait for this promise. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. This is Jesus saying, wait until you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. He goes on to say, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I'd imagine the apostles were like, Wait, what? Wait, 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 like the whole earth? Like everywhere? Like you're calling us to be foreign missionaries? Wait, what is a foreign missionary? Does anyone even know what that is? Jesus, give us a manual. We're going to need money, Jesus. Give us money. Jesus, we'll, we'll need a place to meet. Give us a church building. Give us something, Jesus. And he's like, I'm going to give you something. I'm going to give you the only thing you need. I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit. That's all they needed. That's all that Jesus gave them because that's all they needed. 
And when they had that, they had everything they needed for the church to be born. St. John the 23rd said, Renew your wonders in our time, O Lord, as through a new Pentecost. He said that at the beginning of Vatican II, like, we want the fruit of this whole endeavor to be a new Pentecost upon the church. Pentecost, a spirit of receptivity, that should have been the spirit of Vatican II. That's not where we ended up, unfortunately. But that's what was prayed for. St. John Paul the Great said, the institutional and charismatic aspects are coessential to the church's constitution. Like, it's like two lungs. We have the sacramental hierarchical portion of our church given to us by Jesus, established by Christ. But then we have the charismatic side willed by the Holy Spirit. And both are like lungs in the human body. Both need to be functioning for us to be fully healthy as a church. We need to be breathing deeply of the sacramental life of the church. We need to be breathing deeply of the Holy Spirit. And together, there's completion. There's fullness. St. John Paul the Great goes on to say, it is from this providential rediscovery of the church's charismatic dimension that before and after the council, a remarkable pattern of growth has been established for ecclesial movements and new communities. The charismatic movement, as it, were, as it was called through the 70s and into the 80s, and I think even in the 80s, it started to break out of what we called the charismatic renewal and invade every part of our church. I love how St. John Paul the Great referred to this. He didn't say this is something new, something just made up in recent. He said it was a providential rediscovery. Like we were getting back to the roots of something that the church had for centuries but lost. If you read some of the writings of uh, the church fathers, they will talk about like how they went to say their prayers and they would be chanting in Latin and at different times in the church history. And then their, 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 their chanting in Latin would cease and they would start chanting in tongues. And this would go on for an hour where they were still chanting, but they were all chanting in tongues. Like there have been different times in our church's history where this grace has been poured out. But I believe right now, even more so today, because it is so necessary. The world has gotten so broken and so dark and so evil that if we don't completely surrender to this Holy Spirit, not only are we not going to make it, the church is going to suffer. We need to be the people who can turn it around. It is not what... I do not accept the fact that it's, we're in a situation where it's last person out the door, shut the lights off. Now, we've contracted and we shrink, but this was prophesied by Pope Benedict XVI back in the 70s. And he said the church will become smaller and leaner, and we'll stop worrying about how much money we have and how, much, how, much, how many buildings we have, and we'll start relying on the power of God again. And that's when the church will regain its spiritual uh, dominance in the sense that our legacy will be reborn. When we stop relying on being accepted and loved by the world. Chesterton said, the world is changed by the saints who most contradict the modern times. And in a time where people have dis disregarded truth, redefined love to the fact, to the point where it doesn't mean anything anymore, those who stand up, cling to Christ and say, I stand with the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ, will change the culture or die trying. Because there's nothing like the blood of martyrs to fertilize the growth of the church, because a lot of that happened in the early church as well. And what makes us think that we should have comfortable, casual Catholicism in our lives when the world is going to hell in a handbasket? But we're not going to be the people that God needs us to be without the Holy Spirit. This grace, this power from on high needs to be rushing through every fiber of our being, animating every part of our soul, and we should not stop pursuing the Holy Spirit until he's consumed everything and set everything on fire. Jesus says, I came to cast fire on the earth. I wish that it was already ablaze. He wants you on fire. Pope Benedict XVI said, in effect, Jesus' whole mission was aimed at giving the Spirit of God to men and baptizing them in the bath of regeneration, the bath of new life. 
this baptism in the Holy Spirit. He, he went on to say this, and this is 2008. This is Pope Benedict. He said, today I would like to extend the invitation to all. Let us rediscover, dear brothers and sisters, the beauty of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Let us recover awareness of our baptism and our confirmation. Endless sources of grace. Pope Francis himself said, you, the charismatic renewal, have received a great gift from the Lord. Your movement's birth was willed by the Holy Spirit to be a current of grace in the church and for the church. And what is the first gift of the Holy Spirit? It's the gift of himself. So our popes have been affirming, our church has been affirming, the scriptures affirm that baptism in the Holy Spirit is an experience that's been given to the church to release and strengthen the baptism, the effects of baptism and confirmation. Is it necessary? For some people, it's not because you've been raised Catholic. You've been walking in the Spirit without needing to have it reborn in your life or released in your life. A lot of saints from a very young age were moving in the power of the Holy Spirit, but there's been a lot who started off very badly in, in their lives and ended up very well because they prayed for this release of this grace. For some of us, it is necessary to awaken this grace. It's laid dormant like the chocolate syrup at the bottom of your glass. It needs to be stirred up. It's in there. It just hasn't been released. When you look at what the Catechism says about the fruit of confirmation, it says it is evident from its celebration. This is Article 1302 in the Catechism. It says it is evident from its celebration that the effect of the sacrament of confirmation is a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit as once granted to the apostles on the day of Pentecost. Now, think of your confirmation ceremony. Did it look anything like the day of Pentecost? Were people speaking in tongues? Were tongues of fire coming down? Were people overjoyed in expressing their gratitude and praising God out loud for this great gift they received? No, we all sat there like good little boys and girls with our hands folded. The bishop either slapped us or touched us or did whatever he did. And then we waited for grandma to give us a card with five bucks in it. <laughs> and we considered that our diploma from Catholicism. Because we didn't know there was more. Because we got sacramentalized but not evangelized. But we were, we were told about the Holy Spirit but not told how to experience the Holy Spirit and why it was so essential that we did that. And so, so many people, after years of living this bland, purposeless, powerless Catholicism said, why am I even bothering? I'm leaving. And you know what they did? They went up to the local mega church where they talk about the Holy Spirit, where they talk about Jesus, and they pray in such a way that it stirs them up in their life, and they say, I found what I was looking for that the church never had, and it was ours from the very beginning, and we lost our birthright. We lost our inheritance. We did not pass on this great gift. Somewhere along the line, we blew it. But the charismatic renewal is reviving it, and we need to be bringing this grace of the Holy Spirit to every parish in the country, every parish in the country. People need to be invited to experience this new life in Jesus Christ, and we need to be praying that it happens. This is how we're going to win back. Even if our church has become so small that there's five people in it, but those five people really believe are sold out, that's going to be the seed that starts the rebuilding. Jesus says, every branch of mine that bears no fruit, I prune. He's been pruning his church. Brothers and sisters, this is not Satan winning. This is Christ pruning his bride and getting ready for new growth. And what he's asking is, who's going to stand with me, filled with the power of my spirit to move forward in joy and victory and stop surrendering to fear and doubt and despondency and depression because it's not going to be easy. It's going to cost me something. I don't know. I just want to be comfortable. Has God ever met you in your comfort zone? I'll tell you the answer right now. No, because he doesn't do that. He always expects us to step out of our comfort zone. He always expects us to step out of our comfort zone. But when we do, we meet him there. So this is what it says. This is what it says in the next paragraph after I said about the, the, the catechism talking about what happened on the day of Pentecost. He goes, from this fact, confirmation brings an increase and deepening of baptismal grace. It roots us more deeply in, in divine filiation, which makes us, makes us cry, Abba, Father. 
it unites us more firmly to Christ. It increases the gifts of the Holy Spirit in us. It renders our bond with the church more perfect. It gives a special strength of the Holy Spirit to, just, to spread and defend the faith by word and action as true witnesses of Christ, to confess the name of Christ boldly and never be ashamed of the cross. Wow. Seems like what the church just needs is an overdose of the Holy Spirit. But the good news, brothers and sisters, is we can't overdose on the Holy Spirit. We can only receive, but we can only receive to the capacity that we're open. We can only receive to the capacity that we're empty. St. Mother Teresa said, God can only fill that which is empty. And if you're so full of yourself, guess what? You're never going to be full of the Spirit, ever. You've got to let go of yourself. You've got to do what the saints said we have to do. We have to unite ourselves in Christ's death and die to ourselves so that we can be united with him in his new life this new life of the Holy Spirit. There was a time in my life when I was convinced that I was filled with God. And you know why I was convinced of that? Because I had carved out this small space in my life and said, God, you can have that space. And he filled it. And because he was filling every space in my life that I gave him, I thought he was filling my life and I was so wrong. I had so much more to let go of, so much more to surrender, so much more to open to him. And, when I, and it's been a continual journey. You don't get baptized in the Holy Spirit, check the box and move on. It's an ongoing experience as God invades deeper into who you are. It's like God has conquered the world, but has he conquered your heart? Well, he can't conquer your heart. You can only surrender your heart. Hearts are the only thing that God doesn't conquer. Hearts have to be surrendered. God does not invade and take over. He occupies as you surrender. He occupies as you surrender. I said in the first session, Romans 5.5, 5, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit has been given to us. If there's no space in your heart, there's no room for Jesus, there's no place for that love to go. St. Louis de Montfort wrote in his most wonderful book, True Devotion to Mary. He said, men, and he's quoting St. Thomas. He goes, men say, say St. Thomas, make a vow at their baptism to renounce the devil and all his works. St. Augustine taught that this is the greatest and most indispensable of all vows. Yet who has really kept this great vow? Who has been truly faithful to the promises of holy baptism? Have not all Christians been unfaithful to the promises made to Jesus in their baptism? Where does this universal disobedience come from except from our forgetfulness of the promises and obligations of holy baptism and from the fact that hardly anyone ratifies for themselves the contract they made with God by those who stood as their sponsors? Pump the brakes. That's it in a nutshell. We have to ratify the promises personally that our sponsors made for us at the moment of our baptism. We have to step in. Well, you say, well, I, I, I did that. I do that every Easter. I, I, we renew our baptismal promises. Do we? Or do we just repeat those words? Are we really desirous of what our baptism provides us? I mean, right now, 85% of the young people confirmed this year will not be participating in their church in seven. They'll be gone. Only 20% of Catholic adults practice their faith on a regular basis. Only 30% of Catholics believe in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. Brothers and sisters, these statistics should scare the hell out of us and say, whatever we think we're doing as a church, we're doing it wrong, or we're doing it with the wrong power. Are we trying to sustain the body, the mystical body of Christ with, with mere human effort? Or are we going to let the Holy Spirit renew the bride, revive the bride? The reason why we need to respond to this, why we need to ask for this grace to be poured out in our lives is because the sacraments are not magic. There's two parts to every sacrament. There's what we call opus operantum, and that's God's part. That means every time you go to a sacrament, even if the priest is in mortal sin, because he's been ordained and he gives you that Eucharist, Jesus is present in the Eucharist. It's not dependent upon the holiness of the priest. 
It's not dependent upon you. God makes that, he changes that bread and wine into his body and blood, and there's grace there for everybody. But there's the second part of every sacrament, whether it be confession, communion, confirmation, or baptism. That's our part, the opus operantis, the part where we are in the proper state of receptivity. Those include freedom from mortal sin, hearts and minds attuned and desirous of what God has for us in those sacraments, and a will desirous of that grace. And I can tell you that for the first 18 years of my life, I went to the sacraments on a regular basis, and none of that was true. I didn't want what God... I didn't know. Our own ignorance, our own negligence, our own sinfulness can prevent the grace of our baptism from becoming a lived reality. But what is the opus operantis when it comes to our baptism? What is missing? What haven't we done to receive the fullness of the grace of our baptism? First, it's faith to believe. Faith is not a feeling. You do not have to say, well, I feel like a child of God today to be a child of God today. It's a fact. And it requires a, a will to say, I want what's in there. Because oftentimes, you don't get what's behind the door until you step through the doorway. Faith is stepping through the doorway. Imagine there's a door, and behind that door is everything that you need to be a saint. And you're standing outside and saying, okay, God, I want it, I want it. You need to take a step of faith into that doorway, and all of a sudden you realize, I have access to it now. I've stepped into it. I've said yes. I've made that step of faith. It's receptivity. God, my heart is open. How do you open your heart to God? That's such a great question, huh? How do I know I'm really open to God? How do I know if I'm really wanting what God wants for me in my life? I think I've prayed that prayer, but I'm not sure. If you are sincerely saying you want what God wants in your life today, and you pray this prayer, Jesus, I want what you want for me. I give you my heart. You've done it. Your mind and your will are greater than your feelings. It's only in the last five years that we've decided that feelings are the arbiter of truth the thing that we serve above all things, which has just led to moral chaos and divisive hatred in our world. Because if I, have, if I say anything that upsets you or hurts your feelings, you're personally attacked and triggered and you come after me like, how dare you throw truth in my face? That triggers me and like, we can't even have a... Like our ability to communicate on the fundamental truths that define us because we've met feelings, the most important thing, but our, deeper than our feelings is our will. And our will is, is the gatekeeper. I mean, our, 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 our will is the gatekeeper, gatekeeper. I can say this. Our will is the gatekeeper for our hearts. And when you say, I open my heart to God, your heart opens to God. And God will come in. And sometimes it'll feel amazing. Sometimes you'll feel nothing. Sometimes you feel his love and it's overwhelming and, and tears come. Sometimes you pray and you open your heart to God, you feel nothing. But we don't move because there's feelings. We move because there's truth. We're moving in faith. So with every sacrament, in our total desire for all that God wants to give us, in our surrender to that, that's what happens. And I'll share just real briefly before we go into prayer. For me, I was 18 years old when I went on a retreat uh, put on by NET Ministries. NET stands for National Evangelization Team. It's this wonderful ministry out of St. Paul, Minnesota. They travel around the country. They do retreats and parishes in just about every state. They, there's now NET Ireland. There's NET Canada. There's NET Australia. You know, they're, they're spreading across the globe, and they're going to be spreading even more. And their message is simple. Come to Jesus Christ. Make him the Lord of your life. And I went on one of their retreats in high school, and it was so profound. I didn't give my life to the Lord on that retreat, but I wanted what these people had. So I found myself, right after I graduated from high school in 1983, traveling to Minnesota for a week-long camp. And I got there a day early um, because my mom was uh, going to visit her parents who lived in Wisconsin. They dropped me off in Minnesota, and she went back. And so I got up to the camp a day early, and the team of young adults that was putting the retreat on they were going to have some time of prayer. And he said, John, do you want to uh, join us for prayer? And I was like, <laughs> I mean, no. 
I mean, like, I mean, like, that's what I wanted to say, but how, you know, like Catholic guilt is a real thing, right? Like, oh yeah, I'm up here for a week long retreat and you're going to pray. And the first thing I'm going to do is say no, because I wanted to go fishing. There was like this beautiful lake and I was determined to go get some fishing in before the, the camp started. But they're like, Hey, we're going to pray. You want to join us? I'm like, sure. <laughs> so we, 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 I'm like, where are we going to go pray? They're like, oh no, we're just going to go over the, under this, this beautiful tree and we're just going to take some time to pray. I'm like, okay. So I'm standing there and somebody breaks out a guitar and they start jamming on this guitar, singing a praise and worship song. And I'm like, wow, this is what it, so it sounds like when people actually sing church songs. Because like, I grew up in a parish where the only spiritual manifestation where people were able to sing without moving their lips. It's amazing. Like, every, like we were just like, we sounded like the, the, the teacher from Charlie Brown. Nobody sang. And like these people were not just singing, they were singing loudly. And I'm like, oh, wow. <laughs> they really like to sing. And then they start like putting their hands in the air. And I'm like, do you have a question? What, what is that? You know, like, I mean, like, are you being robbed from behind? Am I missing something? You know, like, they were making, like, some people were putting their hands out in front of them. So, and I was like, what are you doing? That's so weird. And then they got to the end of the song, and the worship leader didn't stop. He just started strumming the guitar and, and shouting out praise. Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. We exalt and magnify you. And they're, like, going for it. And I'm like, oh, man. Where the heck am I now? We're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. This is weird. This is weird. And then the dude, two people down from me, I don't know what was going on, but the only, I can only assume that he had just bought a car and had lots of regret because he was going like, I should have bought a Honda, I should have bought a Honda, I should have bought a Honda, I should have bought a Honda. And I was like, whoa! And like the other guy lost his cat, and this girl was like going, here, kitty, 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 oh, here, kitty, 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 kitty. And this other guy's like, see my new bow tie, see my new bow tie. I'm like, what are you, boy, you're not, you're wearing a t-shirt. And I thought, if I can just like slowly back away into these bushes, get to the cabin and grab my, my duffel bag. I could be hitchhiking home. I could be home in two days. Let's do this. You know, like every part of me wanted to just like get the heck out of there because it was weird. But then, you know, like I was like, I'm not going to look. But I peeked and there was across from the circle, one young lady. And I have to admit, she was very beautiful in many ways. But what attracted to me, me to her in that moment was she was there like this, the big radiant smile on her face going, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. And I realized at age 18, I'd managed to go through all my years of faith formation and received all my sacraments and never had I once in my life said those four words in that order and meant it. And that's when I said, God, whatever she wants, Whatever she has, I want that. I want to be able to tell people I love you. I want to be able to tell you I love you. I don't have that power. I don't know your love. I don't know what she has. This is a mystery to me. But if, this is, if all the other stuff they're doing gets me to that place, I'm open. But it wasn't until three nights later that I went into the confessional because like all throughout the retreat, I kept feeling like I was bound, like I just couldn't get there. And when I stepped into the confessional, I confessed my sins. And when the priest prayed the prayer of absolution over me, and I mean, I confessed everything. I'd only gone to confession one other time in my life, and that was my first confession. And I had broken a number of mortal sins. Some of them had to do with purity. Some of them had to do with stealing, lying. I mean, like it was, it was I mean, I was your typical high schooler. But as I confessed these sins, the, the weight was getting lighter and lighter. And when the priest prayed the prayer of absolution, it was like being in the classic medical school show where the paddles are put on the chest and like, because all of a sudden my heart was alive and I knew I was loved by God. And something that wasn't there was there. The new life of Christ was revealed to me like a snapshot. Boom. And it's not like every problem in my life was worked out. And I never had sin anymore. And I never had, but it was like, God is there, and he is love, and he's worth everything. And I was stunned. I walked and, and did my penance, and then I just said a prayer like, God, no matter what you ask of me, I will say yes. And the next morning, 
the guy who founded Net Ministries came up to me and says, hey, I was praying last night, and I think God would want you to consider being a missionary with Net in August. I think, like, no. <laughs> no. I mean, I had, I'd been accepted at college. I had, you know, I knew I had everything worked out. I had my 10-year plan. I was going to go to undergrad. I was going to be pre-med. I was going to go to, go to uh, medical school. I was going to be a doctor. I was going to have a big house, fancy car, hot wife, everything. I did get the hot wife, by the way. Um, <laughs> but everything else changed. And in that moment, I said, okay, God, if this is what you want, I'm in. And that's what started my life. And I, don't, I, I could share for another hour everything that God's done, but I just can't. Because I want you to experience it for yourself. I want us to turn our hearts now to receive that for you. An awakening. Whatever God wants to do in you. For to just to, us to be able to collectively go before God and say, whatever you want, God, I'm open. And pray those three beautiful words that have been given to us by the church. Come Holy Spirit. And what we're going to do is um, John Paul's going to lead us in a song. And we're just going to ask the Holy Spirit to come and guide us. And after a few minutes of just being in the presence of God, I'm going to lead us in a prayer to give our lives to Jesus Christ. Once again, a complete surrender to God. Because it's Jesus who will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Not me. You don't bap you're not going to baptize yourself in the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the one who baptizes us in the Holy Spirit. We're going to pray, Jesus, come baptize me with your Holy Spirit. Completely flood my life with your grace. And after we give ourselves to Jesus, we're going to come back and give ourselves completely to the Holy Spirit.